and so I'm going to hit record. Um, and then secondly, I want to just remind everyone that we do have a promotion this month um, that is beneficial if you have friends or family members interested in weight loss and that they can have a free clinical assessment, a $200 value as they start the weight loss program as long, as long as they were referred by you. Um, and if you or friends or family members are interested in bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, they can also have their initial panel of labs as part of the uh, uh, hormonal assessment also done quote unquote for free uh, in combination with a consultation, um, which is not free. <laughs> um, but with that, um, Dr. Krauss, if you think we're ready. Yep, we're all set. Oh, great. Um, anyways, delighted to be with you today and uh, discuss a subject that you're a world's expert on and that we're privileged to uh, be privy to your insights today. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, my, 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 I have a series of questions, which the good Dr. Krauss has seen, but the first one really was kind of general. And we want to direct this toward a public, uh, a sort of lay public in ways that hopefully you can understand. So if this sounds obvious, forgive us. But the first question was really, why is treatment of atherosclerotic, hardening of the arteries, uh, cardiovascular disease to prevent heart attack and stroke risk so important? Well, heart attack and stroke um, are the leading cause of death uh, in, in the United States. And... Uh, Everybody in this country uh, has to be concerned about that, and in addition to other health issues that, of course, we're now facing. But uh, cardiovascular disease uh, is something that um, we have to be particularly attuned to because it is very silent. Um, uh, the heart attack and the stroke are due to uh, the loss of blood supply, shown in this slide on the bottom two panels. Um, but uh, on the top, on the left, you see um, the, the cause of all of this is, is called atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is the buildup of cholesterol in plaques um, on the side of the artery wall that can uh, build up, as shown here by the yellow um, uh, globs, which are fat-filled cells, and that they can rupture, actually, and cause a lot of damage and ultimately a blood clot. And so that atherosclerosis process, which begins early in life, is very silent. And so we have to look for clues that that may or may not be present. And that's part of uh, uh, the message that we want to leave you with today is, is how we assess um, the risk for atherosclerosis in a way that can help us prevent um, the later consequences, heart attack and stroke. And, and what kinds of things can really be done to lower that risk of heart attack and stroke? Well, there's categories uh, of risk factors that we should all be aware of. We might maybe touch on that a little bit later, but um, uh, chief among them really is, uh, is, is, is the cholesterol profile in the blood. It's, it's the cholesterol that winds up in the artery, and so uh, we can measure various uh, components of the cholesterol profile, which, which is the main topic for today, and we can deal with that by lifestyle measures, um, diet, weight loss, as well as exercise. Um, but in many cases, there are genetic factors that contribute to that buildup of, of plaque, um, and that requires the use of medication. And I'm sure everybody's aware that the standard uh, treatment these days for um, cholesterol issues that are not responsive to lifestyle change is the use of statin drugs. We may touch on that later as well. But in addition to cholesterol, we have to be concerned about um, all the things that go along with excess adiposity, which include abnormalities and, and glucose and insulin effects that can ultimately uh, predispose to diabetes. Uh, there's high blood pressure. Um, uh, these are things that we can manage as well, often by lifestyle and sometimes with medication. Uh, and then there's habits like, uh, in, in particularly smoking, uh, that I, 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 there's no question that we need to avoid uh, that at all costs as a major risk factor, uh, less, less so these days. Um, and so these are the kind of things we are concerned about in our medical uh, management. That's what our center um, really focuses on, again, with a primary attention to the lipid profile, since, again, many people aren't aware of um, uh, the risk that may be present, um, even using the standard lipid tests. Okay. <clears throat> um, so when it comes to cholesterol, according to the American Heart Association, as well as the American Card College of uh, Cardiology, there are four categories of patients 
for whom treatment is recommended to reduce risk of heart attack and strokes. Can you touch on who they are? And we, we've actually outlined them here as well. Um, yeah, yeah, no, we can review that, Sean. Um, uh, this is a panel that I, I was involved with for several years. Uh, uh, and uh, as, as you say, the first, so there, these are the categories of individuals who um, really are candidates for aggressive lipid management and heart disease risk reduction because their risk is so high. Uh, and these really translate into guidelines for use of statin drugs. Um, so the first three bullets are if someone has already had a heart attack or stroke, there's no question that the risk of having a recurrent episode of either of these is so high that intervention, that a, a treatment of, of cholesterol with, with medication in almost all cases is required. Uh, similarly, in the second uh, bullet, we have people that have very high levels of the bad cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, I'm probably all aware that's the uh, main risk factor that's routinely measured in the standard lipid profile to assess risk and decide uh, uh, how much uh, improvement is necessary. When the level is really high, and 190 is really high, uh, we like to keep it below 100 or even less than that. Um, We'll, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but these are people that almost always have a genetic uh, predisposition to heart disease, and they need to be treated. Uh, and then patients uh, with the, who already have developed diabetes are at high risk for heart disease. So these f first three bullets are all individuals that are, in most cases, if not all cases, candidates for drug treatment. The fourth bullet is the one that we focus on uh, primarily. These are uh, people um, in vulnerable age group, adults, uh, even older than 74, that uh, these guidelines have been kind of moved forward. So we're talking about people at any at any age, um, uh, in, in adulthood, who have a, uh, no history of heart attack or stroke, that don't have diabetes, uh, but in whom we are able to assess the risk of heart attack by using a formula um, that is available to uh, anyone actually on the web uh, that uses cholesterol, um, blood pressure. Uh, but uh, history of diabetes, age, and sex, as well as the HDL cholesterol, which is the good cholesterol, uh, all that's factored into a formula and people's risk is assessed using that equation. And if it's high enough, if the risk is um, greater than 7.5% uh, in 10 years, uh, that, that's really just a, a benchmark um, for initiating treatment. But as we'll talk about, this really still misses a considerable number of individuals who are at risk for heart disease, even if this formula um, turns out to be um, in the low risk range. Uh, it's a crude formula. Um, it's a formula that's used across populations. It's a statistical um, product um, uh, looking at the average across a population. But each individual that we see, and patients that I see in my clinic and others um, who take care of these conditions recognize that there's a, many other factors that play into risk beyond those that are part of this formula um, that can be measured. Uh, and, and this has a lot to do with the lipid profile that we'll talk about. Uh, so we've gone beyond um, this tool uh, in our practice, uh, even though the guidelines haven't quite caught up with us. Mm -hmm. Just <clears throat> out of curiosity, one factor that's not in those algorithms is family history. So how important would you say is family history? And for the people in the audience, how would you define a concerning family history of heart attack or stroke? Yeah, this is uh, something that really has, has not reached a consensus in the field. Um, <laughs> I remember when I first started out uh, X years ago, um, we talked about anybody over the age of uh, males over age 60, women over age 65. Uh, uh, being in the older age group, we, we no longer think in those terms. Um, we uh, uh, so premature heart disease would be people who have younger, um, who have heart attack or stroke at younger ages, and and that would be really the concern from a family history standpoint. Um, so we certainly do pay attention to uh, 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 individuals who have first degree relatives, who have um, siblings or parents, um, or even grandparents who have heart attack or stroke at a young age. Um, but even uh, even for families uh, uh, who have uh, history of heart disease at an older age, uh, really all the way up into the 70s and 80s, if there's multiple members, if there's several members or more, um, that really should be a concern. But this is somewhat of a subjective um, assessment because it's really hard to 
uh, uh, lay down um, rules other than just uh, if somebody comes in and they've had, um, you know, several uh, uncles and aunts and grandparents who have had heart attacks in their 40s, we, we know there's a problem there. And that's almost always a genetic factor mm -hmm. involved. Uh, just one thing, the, uh, having a no, normal, having no family history is not a guarantee because each of us is a unique combination of uh, the genetic influence of uh, both parents. And so uh, any one of us could be at risk, even though um, we don't see a family history uh, in our own cases. Um, <clears throat> so th th this is the standard cholesterol or lipid uh, testing panel. And I really wanted to highlight this for two reasons. I wanted to talk about it itself and also to show people how that's different than the advanced lipid testing panel um, that we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but can you talk a little bit about this panel and which sure. results are the most important and why and which is most predictive of heart attack and stroke? Sure. Uh, well, these are the kind of tests uh, that uh, we all get routinely. Uh, <clears throat> Another, it's recommended that everybody have at least one of these profiles uh, in uh, after after childhood, um, because um, there's a lot of data supporting um, the uh, the value of knowing about your cholesterol level. So the total cholesterol is that first line um, that really um, has to be broken down because, um, as as we just said, um, there is good cholesterol, HDL cholesterol down there and bad cholesterol, LDL cholesterol up there that contribute to the total cholesterol. Uh, and then triglycerides is the third component, which also uh, plays into the cholesterol level. So um, really in terms of assessing risk using the standard approach, uh, we look at the LDL cholesterol, uh, we look at the HDL cholesterol, uh, uh, we look at the triglycerides, and, and there's benchmarks for all of those um, measurements. Um, and then at the bottom, we look at kind of an integrated measurement because uh, since um, cholesterol and the LDL cholesterol are increasing risk and HDL cholesterol is associated with reduced risk, um, if we look at the ratio of those components, and you, we, can, we can use either LDL to HDL or in this case, total cholesterol to HDL, they work equally well um, as another integrated single test. And it's probably the single most useful test across this whole panel uh, for getting a first approximation of heart disease risk. Um, but as we, as we just said, and we'll talk about more, uh, it's, it's really only uh, uh, one step, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an important step, but it's, it doesn't get us all the way to um, the goal of getting the optimal assessment of heart disease and stroke risk. Um, and I just want to remind everybody while we move on to the next portion of this that you can ask questions at any time through the Q&A tab. Um, so feel free. Um, but I think we wanted to start with this case example before we move on to how advanced lipid fractionation testing or advanced lipid testing is different and why it can be beneficial for certain people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is something, Sean, uh, Dr. Burke, that I uh, that, that represents a, a real case. There's, we've, we've disguised certain features of it. It's, uh, it's not somebody that can be identified but it is uh, a member of the Jumpstart um, program that um, uh, was referred to me um, because of concerns uh, that um, there, there were cholesterol problems. Uh, and so this case uh, illustrates the rationale for uh, not accepting the standard lipid measurements as being the be-all and the end-all. The ones we just reviewed um, can be a clue, but there, but this case will show uh, why that is not sufficient in, in, in a significant number of individuals. So this is a 68-year-old uh, woman who was told she had high cholesterol um, uh, at least eight or nine years ago. Uh, and as is often the case in people that come to see me, they are hopeful that they can avoid taking statins. And um, uh, that's a whole other issue that uh, we can discuss maybe at a later time. Um, we have to look carefully, not just at uh, the, uh, the overall uh, uh, positive features of uh, statin treatment, but also the possible downside. And many mm -hmm. are concerned about that. But this is a person that's been very healthy all her life. She, uh, this, this, her weight is quite normal. So she didn't, uh, so she's been a successful, <laughs> a successful person in the program here. Um, no high blood pressure. 
Uh, and she did, but she does have a family history, and this gets to the question raised earlier, uh, which is kind of suggestive. So there's no, uh, you know, father and brother have high cholesterol. Uh, they didn't get heart attacks because they were on medication, probably. Um, but a paternal grandfather did have two heart attacks. So that's the sort of thing, there's no, as I say, there's no kind of formula for this, but it, it raises a suspicion that there's something going on genetically. She's very careful about her diet, um, stays away from meats, and then, uh, minimizes intake of uh, sugar and fats, doesn't smoke, walks a lot. So this is really somebody that's very concerned about her health and has done a good job. Um, the next bullet down is hemoglobin A1C, which is an index of diabetes predisposition. That, that number is normal. Um, but here's her cholesterol, uh, and this is on her diet, cholesterol 205. Uh, and again, the total is not, not so important as are the individual components. So her LDL cholesterol was 132, and I mentioned 100 or so is optimal. 130 is kind of borderline. So she is a little high, even on the standard test. Um, but in somebody who's otherwise healthy and who has sort of a borderline LDL cholesterol, that's sometimes acceptable um, if, if everything else is, uh, is healthy. That's where we sometimes use that risk formula that I mentioned. Her HDL uh, is a little bit on the low side. It's not super low. Less than 50 in a woman would be considered um, on the low side. Triglycerides, 135. There we look for levels ideally less than 130, um, uh, ideally even better than that. Um, so that's a little bit on the high side. So, and her ratio, cholesterol to HDL is 4.5. We like to keep it less than three. So, so here's somebody that actually does show using her standard lipid test, somewhat of a kind of a moderate increase in risk, but, but with, with no other serious risk factors. Um, she had a legitimate concern that she really need uh, to go to the next step and take a statin. Well, her 10 year risk based on the formula I talked about, 7.2%, not 7.5. So she just sneaks in under the wire. Um, so this is kind of the borderline situation where um, it really helps to get more detailed testing. And this is the sort of introduction to the advanced lipid testing uh, that we do that goes beyond the standard formulas um, that helps us assess, assess risk, particularly in situations where we don't have a clear cut uh, assessment using a uh, standard tool. So that's on the, on the next slide, um, I think, Sean. This introduces, do you want to go right to this, Sean? Um, yeah, I think that'd be great if that yeah, sounds good. Yeah, yeah, because it introduces the whole issue of advanced lipid testing. You may have heard this term. Uh, we sort of created it along the way because we devised tests um, that allowed us to break down the standard profile into much more meaningful uh, units. Um, and that's because each of the measurements we talked about uh, LDL, cholesterol, HDL, cholesterol in particular, uh, represents the sum of uh, particles in, um, uh, in each of these components. And I, I, uh, you've, uh, I, I think uh, you have the pointer, right? I, I, don't, I don't think my pointer is I, Is that look like? Maybe we can start off, yeah, showing the LDL, thanks. So, so, so here is shown um, really little images um, that, that describe the breakdown of different forms of LDL in the blood. And this is where it gets um, interesting <laughs> uh, because um, LDL cholesterol is the sum of the cholesterol in each of these components. And there is quite a few, four of them are shown here in this uh, line from larger on the right to smaller on the left. And uh, it turns out that the size of the LDL particles makes a difference. And um, the smaller LDL particles are the ones that are more dangerous. That's highlighted down at the bottom. There's another component that's measured with an LDL called LP little a off there on the right. Uh, and we we'll talk about that either a little bit later this time or next. Um, it's another genetic, it's, it's a strongly genetically influenced form of LDL uh, that along with a small LDL, those two things are really the most dangerous forms of LDL in the blood. Um, and then uh, down the bottom is the HDL, and we look for larger HDL particles. Again, there's number there's many different forms of HDL, just like LDL, going from very very tiny to pretty pretty big. And it's the larger forms that we look for uh, that reflect a, a healthier um, HDL, um, uh, which is more information than the standard uh, HDL cholesterol test provides. Then on the upper um, right are uh, particles that all come together under triglyceride. And I'm not gonna spend time describing all of these. We, we measure these. We don't have strict criteria yet for um, uh, using those uh, as, as treatment targets. Um, 
we tend to use triglyceride as a way of reducing these remnant particles, which are um, triglyceride enriched forms of lipoproteins um, called VLDL that are particularly atherogenic. So these remnant particles are a bad guy. So everything in the red box represents things that we measure in the LDL. Um, size and the LPA are the ones that we really pay most attention to because those are the ones that uh, really drive our risk assessment uh, in our uh, clinical uh, approach um, to um, evaluating whether patients should be on uh, drug treatment or not. Um, so knowing this information um, is, is really helpful, but um, just looking at a picture like this doesn't give us uh, much to go on. We have to have numbers. And I think, um, Sean, on the next slide, uh, do you have a... a and, and just to point out one thing before we get there. Yeah. In the last LDL that we looked at at the standard panel, I think it's meaningful for people to realize that LDL doesn't exist in the world. It's a calculated estimate of what your low-density lipoprotein or LDL actually is. Whereas what Dr. Krauss is talking about here, using this advanced lipid testing, we can actually measure the total concentration of the low density lipoprotein or LDL particles, and then all the different subcomponents that make up that LDL, yeah. uh, which yeah. is really fascinating that, you know, we all grew up in the kind of LDL, calculated LDL era, and we place so much importance on that, and yet it's something that actually doesn't exist. That's, that's right, thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, LDL cholesterol is the first approximation. Um, uh, of the cholesterol and these particles, but it's the particles that wind up uh, being hazarded. You know, we, we started talking about atherosclerosis. It's the particles that deliver the cholesterol uh, to the artery wall that, that really uh, carry all of the risk, and um, LDL cholesterol doesn't give us that information. Um, you can have a perfectly normal LDL cholesterol. Uh, let's see. Let's go to the next, I think the next slide. I'll go to the next one if you want. I think that was... That was uh... Oh, what is that? Just a repeat of the prior case example, and okay. then we can go. Yeah, let's go to the numbers because yeah. because so this is really uh, this is a report um, that translates what we've just been talking about into into real data. That um, just like the standard lipid profile, we use this advanced lipid panel uh, to drill down into a more a meaningful assessment of risk. Uh, and this is exactly the way a report is delivered from Quest Diagnostics. This involves, I'll disclose at this point, this is a test that I was involved in developing and that Quest Diagnostics uh, um, licensed and is, and, and, and is used widely uh, for this advanced lipid testing application. Um, and um, it's what we used um, for, uh, for our clinic. And this patient had uh, this analysis done. Um, and here we go from the top, looking at not LDL cholesterol, but LDL particle number. So this is, as we said a moment ago, a much more meaningful test because it's the particles that count. It's, uh, they deliver cholesterol, but um, um, because they all contain different amounts of cholesterol, we can't tell whether the particles are larger or smaller. Uh, so we look at uh, several features here. We look at the total particles. And as you can see, the optimal, is, these are all in red. So uh, I guess the message, just looking at the color code here, is uh, everything we measured here that uh, is important for risk that goes beyond the standard lipid panel uh, is in the high risk range in the red zone. The total particle number is way high. It's uh, greater than 1409, it's higher than 1676. And then we look at the breakdown, focusing on the small LDL and also the medium, it's just a medium sized LDL. Those two together are the ones that are, are most closely related to risk. Uh, and in her case, they were extremely high as well. Um, her HDL large was low, that red is because it's low. Uh, and then the next line is called LDL pattern. And there's pattern A, which is mainly larger LDL, which is a good uh, thing to have. And pattern B is mainly smaller LDL, which is a bad thing to have. So she has pattern B and that's often genetic. And that's related to the uh, LDL peak size on the bottom uh, being small. So she has increased levels of LDL particles. They're the bad kind, small and medium. She's got low levels of the good HDL. She's got the small LDL profile. Um, and then finally, to top it off, she has an elevation of lipoprotein. That's, that's LP little a, the, the other character I showed uh, earlier. It's called LP little a. 
greater than 75, um, uh, way above 75. So she's got a full, full package of cardiovascular risk. And these are, you know, these are real numbers and they're buried under the standard lipid results. You never would have known. I, I wouldn't have had any way of uh, guessing that we'd have all of these factors other than the clue perhaps of the family history that there may be something going on genetically. But this puts, this all, this, this puts that all in, in really concrete terms and gives us, um, her and me, <laughs> um, uh, the information we need to start deciding uh, uh, that this is, deserves attention. Um, and given her uh, lifestyle practice, uh, we would ordinarily encourage things she's already doing, uh, uh, keeping her weight down, limiting carbohydrates, which is a big factor that affects the small LDL. It's what we really focus on because it's not so much saturated fat, which we all worry about uh, in our diets, and it's reasonable to try to be careful about saturated fat, but it's the carbohydrates and the, and, and the processed carbohydrates in particular that drive this small LDL uh, profile, and so, but, and so, but she's doing all that. So she actually does become a candidate for drug treatment. But there are other people we find similar profiles uh, in which we can make some uh, headway with uh, lifestyle factors, exercise uh, as well. So uh, this is the literally the red flag that um, we hope isn't there, but when we find it, um, we want to change it to a green flag. And uh, uh, this is the challenge we have with this patient, and we're still in the process of managing her, by the way. Um, some future time, we might get some follow-up. She was, she was quite willing, by the way, to allow me to present her case. So um, I think it's quite instructive, and I hope you understand uh, how this impacts um, uh, health. Like you said, it's super interesting because you just don't see that on the standard cholesterol panel. No, it's completely buried. And, th and this is not uncommon. And the reason is, if, you know, it's getting into the, the arithmetic. Um, LDL cholesterol um, is influenced by the amount of cholesterol in the LDL particles. So um, the small LDL actually have less cholesterol per particle um, than the larger LDL. The larger LDL is not shown here, but, uh, but when we measure a small LDL, we're not measuring cholesterol so much. So, so the cholesterol uh, in the LDL can be normal, but there still could be a, a lot of these small cholesterol depleted particles that are just not um, detected um, uh, by the screening for LDL cholesterol. And um, it, this is a test that <laughs> I think you know, should be done probably more often. Um, uh, it's not that terribly expensive. It, uh, it just completes the risk profile, but it hasn't yet reached the standard um, uh, that even many physicians uh, look for. Um, uh, they just sometimes don't understand it. Uh, they don't think uh, the evidence is there uh, that it impacts uh, patient care, but I can, I can assure you that it does have a huge influence. I think there's a lot of physicians in the lipid area that would endorse it as well. And even on that note, how prevalent is a high-risk lipoprotein little a? And yeah. it kind of looks like the risk range that you're defining as high risk is yeah. Yeah. over 75. Now, she's 100 points over 75. Right. How much higher is that, per se, than uh, being 76? <laughs> Well, first of all, uh, you know, there's sort of a, again, that 75 is picked, like, like, like all these numbers, we pick a single number just because we need some sort of benchmark. It's obviously there's, uh, there's a range. We don't, you know, it could be 70. Like, you know, if it were 76, I'd, uh, I'd be concerned. If it were 74, I'd be concerned. Well, hers is, is, is more than twice normal. So that puts her risk way up, just from the LP little a, from that number alone, probably three or four times um, what it would be without that risk. So. Um, the combination of that level and the small LDL uh, would increase the risk probably by about tenfold uh, compared with someone who didn't have either of those uh, conditions. And it is a common problem. I'll be a late to answer your question. is is common. It, uh, about a third of us carry a version of the gene, which is a major influence on the level of, of LPL A. Um, that will raise uh, the LPA to a high risk level greater than 75. So a third of the population is walking around with this silent risk factor. And LPA a is, is really particularly deadly because um, it's very strongly associated um, with stroke, even more so than the LDL. Um, so it's heart disease and stroke. 
and also can cause problems with heart valves. So um, uh, one of the concerns with OPLA, which people might be asking, well, if it's strongly genetic, what do we do about it? I didn't mention um, the use of diet or, or drugs to lower OPLA, and that's because we have very limited ability to manipulate OPLA with the current uh, treatments that are available. Uh, but they're coming along. And so many of my patients like her who are concerned because of this um, uh, are waiting, hopefully, that uh, the drug will be uh, released soon that could actually lower LPLA substantially. In the meantime, the way we approach this problem is to really work hard on everything else. That is, um, the impact of high LPLA can be neutralized to a large extent by um, knocking down levels of these. Uh, LDL particles um, to levels that are maybe even lower than we might uh, ordinarily uh, hope to achieve. So patients like her and others that I uh, manage with high LPLA, we really shoot for LDL particle numbers, looking up at the top there, not just less than 1100, and that means 1138. We try to get it down below seven or 800, and we can do that. Um, that does require medication, um, but in this situation, uh, that's entirely justified based on the evidence that we can turn around the risk if we really work hard on these other uh, measurements. On that note, should we, let's see, what's our, well, that was, uh, I think we've got that based on that, or we kind of yeah. talked about it already a little bit. Yeah, well, this is, uh, oh, th well, this is a diet effect, yeah. So this is something uh, that we, I touched on earlier. This is actually data from my own research program um, uh, at UCSF, where we've done a lot of studies using uh, diets that differ in their carbohydrate content. Um, and so this is um, a, a graph comparing um, the, uh, a diet that has a high carb intake, you know, pretty high, 65% of calories is, is pretty high, and a lower intake of 45%. Now that's not as low uh, as, as we like to um, aim for uh, in our program here. We want to go much lower than that, but this just compares that 20 point difference. Um, and you can see that uh, going from left to right, um, the impact of that higher carb diet just uh, is, co is completely focused on the small LDL and also even the smaller form. There's the, the, it's, a, uh, it's a very small LDL and the small LDL. And these two components go way up on a high carb diet. So the reverse is what we aim for. Going to lower carb, um, we can reduce those particles. And that is a main theme um, uh, for the lifestyle approach that um, often works um, in people who have this problem of having too much, um, too many of these small and very small LDL particles. Um, weight loss and limiting carbohydrate can really knock those levels down in many cases. And so that's one reason I'm <laughs> particularly, uh, one reason we got together with uh, the Jumpstart in the first place, and Sean and I have been working together for a long time because we share a similar concern about carbohydrate, its metabolic effects, and this is one of the reasons for that. Well, you, you know, it's interesting. Um, how does insulin resistance, which I think is driven by excess carb consumption in many cases, and small, dense LDL particles, that sort of pattern be picture, how do those two interrelate? Yeah. Uh, and yeah. That, that might be a subject for another day. <laughs> yeah, 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 and it brings in the whole issue of, of fat around the middle and uh, the role that that plays. And so these things are all in, interconnected. Um, uh, the, uh, these risk factors, these, these, these metabolic, cardiometabolic risk factors related to lipids and insulin resistance and adiposity, um, all are, are, are kind of related. And, uh, and, and weight loss can impact all of them uh, simultaneously. We can talk about the relationships later. They're, 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 they're strongly interrelated. There are people, however, that have insulin resistance who have perfectly normal particles and others who have uh, high particles but no insulin resistance. So it's not um, uh, a, a one-to-one -one correspondence, but, but they do tend to cluster together. Right, interesting. Um, <clears throat> so... Oh, should we go keep going? If, 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 if this is a good time, we can... Uh, we fine with me. I got, I got, I got the time. I just didn't know how much time you wanted to give. Yeah, yeah no, so this, mm -hmm. I meant you, you want to go into the treatment because this is really, again, real data um, uh, from this real patient. Um, when I showed her the results, we talked about them. We had, and even though she was 
concerned about statins, uh, I think the data uh, and the uh, interpretation of the data that we just talked about turned her around, uh, got her thinking uh, correctly, in my view, about um, the benefits of statin outweighing the risks in her case. So we put her on uh, uh, one of the statins, or superstatin, at a modest dose. Uh, and after three months, um, you can see what happened on the top. Um, her cholesterol level came down. More importantly, her LDL cholesterol came way down and read there by 35%. Her other numbers uh, didn't change an awful lot. Ratio actually dropped a few points. Um, but her estimated 10-year risk dropped you know, a touch down 7.2 to 6.8. Uh, and her particles did better as well. Um, uh, but you can see they're, they're, still, they're still in the high risk zone. If you look at the small and medium LDL, 217, 286, they're still well above what we consider optimal. And particularly because of her help, your little A drop, that doesn't usually happen um, uh, with statin. That's a little bit unusual, but um, uh, it's, it, everything is still high. Um, and so uh, because of this profile, uh, putting her at high risk in the family history um, and the multiplication of risk by the LP little a and the small LDL, all those things um, meant that we needed to uh, push harder. We, uh, we needed to really optimize further. So we, we were um, in the process of um, uh, increasing our medication uh, to see how far we can turn this, this around. But this is how we use, this is how I use um, this profile, not just to assess risk, but even more importantly, I think, um, to assess how well we are managing that risk um, by treatment. And this, you know, in some cases, this diet alone uh, and weight loss, but here we're talking about medication. And uh, in either case, we, we have goals, and the goals are to optimize uh, the risk. I mean, patients I see um, are generally motivated, which I appreciate, uh, and understand uh, the rationale for really trying not just to uh, how to uh, touch the surface, but to really um, uh, correct the underlying problems. Let's see. <clears throat> so this was a little bit of a yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a conclusion. I, I gave a talk on this uh, at the American Diabetes Association uh, not long ago, and uh, these are kind of uh, the messages. Uh, the first first couple of points anyway uh, is if you, if there's a borderline estimated uh, risk of heart disease like we had in this in this case uh, using the standard formulas um, uh, it can be extremely helpful uh, particularly if there's a family history um, uh, so you and you ask I guess the next bullet about atherogenic dyslipidemia that's a multisyllabic <laughs> term that we developed. Um, to, to uh, really capture the cluster that I mentioned earlier, um, consisting of small LDL particles, low levels of HDL, uh, high levels of triglyceride, and these remnant particles, this, this, this cluster of these three different categories um, of uh, lipids um, has been called atherogenic dyslipidemia. Uh, and it's a key component of a, even a broader syndrome that uh, we've called metabolic syndrome. I was on a panel that helped to define this uh, American Heart Association a few years ago. Um, it's challenging because, as I mentioned, um, there are things that go beyond the lipids that tend to cluster as well with this lipid profile, uh, including uh, fat around the middle, um, uh, insulin resistance, as Sean was saying, uh, predisposition to gout is another factor, uh, hyper, high blood pressure can go along with this, uh, pre-diabetes, all of these things tend to be part of the metabolic syndrome, and, um, and that's something that um, you kind of know it when you see it, because um, you have patients that have more than two or three of these components together that constitutes the metabolic syndrome. Uh, and family history can go along with that in the third bullet um, because of the genetic underpinnings to all of this. There's, there's strong genetic influences on all of this, um, but it doesn't mean um, that every, every genetic uh, abnormality is fixed and immutable. Um, for the most part, we can correct uh, the expression or the uh, manifestations of the, that gene, the high LDL, small LDL profile, uh, high tri triglyceride, all those things tend to be reversible, even though they have a genetic underpinning. The LP little a is a little more challenging. As I say, we don't yet have means of dealing with that gene, but um, uh, for the most part, we can uh, 
really modify the genetic effects by um, medicate by lifestyle or medication. So family history is a clue, but this doesn't mean that you're destined to repeat your family history if it's uh, if it's worrisome to you. Uh, any other uses for advanced lipid testing? Um, uh, well, you know, I guess I hadn't thought too much about that. I think that um, uh, you know, people that, that, that have uh, any any kind of diabetes tendency, I think, should also uh, consider advanced lipid te testing because, again, uh, 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 the tendency to diabetes is often associated with um, underlying um, changes in the lipoprotein particle profile. And we talked about the last uh, earlier about uh, using this for uh, assessing how well uh, we're doing when we start treating uh, these problems. Great. So let's see if we have any questions. It looks like we do have a few. Um, one question was, how is the HDL ratio, I think that was the total cholesterol to HDL ratio calculated. Um, okay. What a good ratio for males? Okay, that's yeah, a good question. So um, uh, the, the ratio is actually the total cholesterol. It, it's, it's sort of a simple, total cholesterol is a simpler measurement uh, and, and, and the ratio is obtained just by dividing that number by the HDL cholesterol. So total cholesterol is a little bit more robust than even the LDL cholesterol uh, for use in this ratio. And, and it's a simple formula, um, dividing the total cholesterol by the HDL cholesterol. Um, in theory, um, that ratio uh, could be lower in women because women tend to run higher HDL cholesterols, but the risk relationships are pretty similar for men and women. So when I mentioned a ratio greater uh, than or less than three would be optimal, that would apply really to both sexes. Um, many of my patients, particularly patients who have other risk factors like the one we just talked about with high LPLA, I'd like to get the ratio down even lower than that um, to uh, two or less. But again, that's just one uh, piece of the equation, the, the particle measurements we just talked about. All of this comes into play. So um, we look at everything, and the ratio is not the be-all and the end-all, but it's an important tool. And if ratio is high, greater than four, um, that's certainly uh, one of the red flags that we would be concerned about. Someone wanted to know, if I were interested in having a cholesterol consultation with Dr. Krauss, what would I do? Uh, let me, I'm gonna, I can answer. <laughs> answer that because I, I a, you yeah. probably know more about system than I do. So if, if, yeah, if the simple thing, if you're a JumpStart member, um, you would tell your clinician or the receptionist that you were interested in an appointment with Dr. Krauss at what we call the CCMH for short, which stands for the Center for Cardiometabolic Health, um, and then they could sign you up for a consultation that you could either do in person, although you'd have to go to Piedmont. Uh, to the Jumpstart Center in Piedmont, or you can do it via video conference, or frankly, if needed, you know, for simplicity's sake, even via phone. These uh, days, by the way, that's almost exclusively what we're doing because of the COVID right. situation. Yeah, my my personal bias in the past was always to urge people to come meet Dr. Krauss in person on the first time, in particular, if they were yeah. coming from far away. And then you can always do video conference visits downstream. But uh, I always like yeah. to kind of. Yeah, I prefer that as well. Yeah. yeah. But anyways, it's, it's, it's easy to do if you're interested. There is an initial charge as a separate um, but complementary or related program um, for the consultation and then for follow-up visits if you continue having him help to manage your cardiovascular risk. We also do that in clinic at no additional charge. Um, so that's another option if interested. If you have a more simple case, so to speak, um, you can have us help manage your cardiovascular risk in clinic using a protocol or algorithm that he helped us develop. Um, that being said, um, it's a really unique and wonderful opportunity to be able to sit down with one of the world's leading researchers in cholesterol and uh, you know, get his point of view. And his mother did not tell me to say that, but but it's true. Having having sat with him for quite a while, kind of meeting the patients and hearing his point of view, I think it's a really unique and wonderful opportunity. So anyways, for anybody who might be interested, I would recommend that strongly. And then, you know, downstream, the frequency of those visits can become as 
little as, you know, once a year just to check in and make sure that therapeutic targets that he sets for you are achieved and optimized and, you know, really significantly mitigate the risk of having a downstream heart attack or stroke. Um, so is that, is that fair to say? Uh, from, yeah, from my standpoint, yeah, yeah, no, and I and I really uh, value the affiliation that I've had for the last several years uh, because what we're dealing with is so complementary to the goals of the Jumpstart program. And I'll, I'll add one other thing that before you see him, it is required that you do the test that he designed, specifically the ion mobility lipid fractionation test that we can draw the blood for, and then we'll ultimately send it to Quest. We also almost always nice pretty much, let's just say always, in fact, that's our panel. We do add the lipoprotein little a that he talked about earlier because it's such a common independent cardiovascular risk factor that really amplifies the risk of whatever LDL levels you might have, whatever you know the rest of your profile might be, i.e. insulin resistant profile, LDL elevated profile, uh, family history profile, um, and just I think gives him a more complete picture of where your risk might be and thus how aggressively to potentially optimize your LDL levels with or without medications. Um, so, so we have now a question, which is great because this person originally sent a note that said, I have been doing through the Jumpstart program, advanced lipid testing, the ion mobility test that we talked about with regular periods of around every five months, I believe she was saying. And now then there's a follow-up question here. I remain at about 140 pounds, BMI 23, heart scan, which is another subject we'll cover on a different day and a great, great thing to talk about at some point. Heart scan in August 2019 of zero, family history of high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, stroke, high cholesterol. I am not interested in taking statin drugs as my family members do. My blood Merck in May 2020 was a hemoglobin A1C normal, 5.3%. Total cholesterol elevated, but as he noted earlier, not necessarily a particularly beneficial test, but a 253, so elevated. LDLC of 114, HDL 128, <coughs> triple digit HDL, that's unusual. <coughs> Triglyceride low at 37, and that must be ratio 0.9, I'm not sure which one that is. LDL particle numbers were LDL particle, LDL particle number total of 1,100, small LDL particle concentration 156, medium 187, uh, large HDL 11,469, pattern A and peak size, blah, blah, blah. Question, can I safely continue to avoid statin use by managing my weight and health with low-carb diet and daily exercise? Great question. Yeah, well, um, as I tell people uh, who email me relatively frequently <laughs> with questions like this, I, I hesitate to practice medicine, um, you know, without actually uh, getting a full consultation. But um, I can, in, in this context and with this amount of data, uh, give you a first uh, kind of approximation of what I, what I, how I feel about this. Uh, first of all, that ratio, by the way, is probably LDL to HDL, uh, which is another way of doing the ratio. Uh, right. that's, that's I get the point nine. Um, <laughs> And so, uh, based on this profile uh, and um, you know the overall health, um, uh, it would be sort of um, questionable whether there's really a need given the HDL being so high. Not now, high HDL doesn't always confer protection, so they've got to be a little cautious about that. But but overall, the profile, um, uh, the ratio, of the, and the uh, small and medium LDL particle numbers are low enough, uh, and the HDL, and the large HDL is high enough that this really falls into sort of the extreme opposite of the genetic pattern B. The, this is sort of the super A um, profile, which, um, which, which tends to be uh, healthy. And nevertheless, um, there's always a concern with the LDL 114, that's a little bit on the high side. Uh, so here I would be strongly influenced and I would often advise uh, what, is, what, what, uh, what this uh, individual has already done, and that is to obtain a coronary artery calcium scan. As I said, we can talk about this next time. But this is another tool that, um, that is now really established as a way of distinguishing um, what might be a worrisome profile from one that can sort of wait uh, before yeah. we intervene. And so having a zero calcium score would tip me um, towards uh, supporting uh, the desire to avoid statins. You know what's really interesting about this story too, and I, I'm going to 
ask the person without stating your name, but uh, the prior question revealed that they'd lost 50 pounds at Jumpstart. So went from 190 pounds to 140 pounds. I'm very curious whether you did a pre-Jumpstart intervention eye and mobility test and profile, because what I'd love to know is how did your panel change through going from a higher risk weight to a completely normal, really ideal weight? Um, and anyways, that's a really, that would have been a really interesting test to do, because I think there's a chance that your cholesterol profile looked totally differently at 190 than it does today. And that would have been really interesting to see. Yeah, so and this, this would be a success story then. Yeah, amazing story. It's right. great. So that, let me see, I think, I think that may be the ends of our questions for today. Uh, what time is it? And it's, it's, I think yeah. it's 12. So um, first of all, Dr. Krauss, thank you so much for joining us today. That was really interesting and I thought super helpful. Um, second of all, thank you all for joining us and um, we'll look forward to hopefully seeing you again next week. Um, and at Jumpstart Live on Tuesdays, if any interest with uh, any other questions that we could try and answer there. So thank you again. Um, anybody who has friends or family members or others who are interested in seeing this later, it will be stored on the member portal, as you all know, um, and can be accessed there if and as desired. Okay. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye.